When we last left our heroes, they were focusing mainly on domestic issues, but foreign policy problems are eventually going to shake up the United States out of its self-imposed isolation in the aftermath of World War I. After World War I, the United States had become clearly a global, the global economic power, as most of the European powers were devastated. Plus, during the age of imperialism, the United States expanded economically throughout Latin America. So despite attempts by American politicians to isolate the United States, we'd always been part of the global system. In Asia, this crisis came to a head first. Japan had been expanding rapidly, as we talked about in previous lectures. The military was looking for new sources of economic, uh, new sources of, uh, re of raw materials in order to power their economic engine. And so in 1931, the Japanese created an incident in Manchuria by blowing up a rail car and used it as an excuse to annex the entire region, making it into the puppet state of Manchu Kuo. Then, after something called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, the, unit, the Japanese used this um, conflict between Chinese and Japanese soldiers to start annexing and taking more direct control over the city of Shanghai. Urban warfare then began, and uh, the Japanese started to invade China proper in 35, and then by 1937, they had taken over the Chinese capital of Nanjing. The Japanese destruction of Nanjing happened in full view of the international press, as had the Battle of Shanghai. Uh, Americans were present at these places and were reporting back. And so, as all of this happened, the United States, as all of this happened, the United States public opinion started to turn sharply against the Japanese, who we'd always been racist towards, but had seen as sort of the civilized nation of Asia. But as the Japanese systematically killed the population of Nanjing, public opinion started to shift away from the Japanese even more sharply. But it would take significantly more for the United States to actually get involved. We funneled significant amounts of money to the Nationalist Army under Chiang Kai-shek, but in order to actually get American troops involved, there'd clearly need to be a, some larger provocation. In Europe, problems were just beginning. Obviously, Adolf Hitler's seizing of power in the early 1930s through a series of elections was somewhat problematic. And his annexation and uh, or his remilitarization of the Rhineland was clearly in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, as was the Anschluss with Austria. But when he tried to take on the Sudetenland, the powers of Europe sort of uh, stood up against him. Kind of. Neville Chamberlain told Hitler that he could annex the Sudetenland but no other territory, and therefore, and uh, gave this really embarrassing speech where he uh, waved this piece of paper in the air declaring that it was, quote, peace in our time, which ended up being incredibly embarrassing because, of course, this policy of appeasement giving into uh, aggressors to stop a larger conflict ended up being very, very ineffective in the run up to World War II. For the United States, as the world in both Asia and, the, uh, and Europe got closer to war, we gave money to both sides, well, not to both sides, but both to the nationalist Chinese fighting against the Japanese and also to the British and French in preparation for their war against uh, a more aggressive Nazi Germany. Originally, we were only going to be providing non-military goods, and they could only be purchased with cash and then carried on non-American vessels. The goal, of course, is to prevent a sort of a Lusitania-type incident from dragging the United States into the war. But obviously, as both of these sides gets, become increasingly stretched, it's going to be very, very difficult for the United States to hold to these sort of strict uh, cash-and-carry policies. And in the United States, there was a very strong isolationist movement. The America First Party argued that war, that America should be put first, of course, and that we should stay out of European and Asian wars in order to protect American lives. And, you know, they called back to or brought up, you know, the pointlessness of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles and how it solved none of these issues. And so... They were arguing, of course, for American isolation. 
The most famous member of the America First Party was none other than uh, noted celebrity Charles Lindbergh. We remember him, of course, as the handsome farm boy who flew nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. Charles Lindbergh spoke for a number of uh, spoke in a number of America First rallies and was probably their most notable spokesperson. Although a number of American politicians were also associated with this, this was both because Lindbergh was, uh, the, you know, legitimately upset or legitimately wanted to keep the United States out of the war, and also because he may have had some pro-Nazi sympathies. The result of all of this is that we passed a series of neutrality acts and uh, prevented Congress put up further roadblocks to prevent uh, Franklin Roosevelt from doing similar things to what Woodrow Wilson had done in the run-up to the First World War to stop the pattern from sort of uh, from repeating itself because clearly you know war breaking out in Europe and Asia the United States officially staying neutral but clearly providing arms to only one side we can sort of see where this is going. And, of course, uh, Roosevelt Roosevelt was gaining increasing power. And so for the America First Party, you know, Roosevelt's own dictatorial tendencies allowed them to, you know, compare him slash criticize him. And uh, Dr. Seuss here is, you know, lambasting uh, Lindbergh, but with a criticism that the America First Party would have used. The war in Europe started with the invasion of Poland. Of course, the war in Asia had been being fought for two years or seven years, depending on how you count, uh, depending on if you count it with the invasion of Manchuria or when the capital of Nanjing fell. But, if, but the war in Europe started with Hitler's invasion of Poland. This was part of a secret pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, where they agreed to, to uh, stage an incident to make it look like Poland attacked the Germans, and then they'd invade simultaneously and crush the country between them. This was terrifying for the Allies because obviously the Nazis hate the communists and the communists hate the Nazis and they were both the uh, standard boogeymen for both of their societies. And so uh, the union between Hitler and Stalin, as we see here, was very, very inconvenient and surprising to most people. Obviously, uh, it was not to last over the long term, and, surprise, and Stalin was surprisingly naive about the whole thing, but for most of the West, it appeared that the USSR was no longer an ally, and Germany would not have to fight a two-front war this time, which would make a massive difference. And, of course, for the United States and for the America First Party, there was massive suffering in Poland, as I'm sure you learned about in world history class. And uh, the America First Party claimed or argued that we should mostly stay out of these conflicts again because we don't want to risk ourselves over some pointless foreign war. And then France falls. Uh, world history, I've hopefully spent some time on this, so I'm going to go through it super quickly. There was a period of waiting for several months where both sides sort of built up their troops. Germany crushed Denmark and then uh, Norway, and then the Blitzkrieg came to France. Uh, the Allies had assumed that the they had assumed that their fortifications along the Maginot Line would be sufficient because the Ardennes forest is pretty dense, and so they didn't think that the type of uh, mechanized uh, mechanized tactics or tank-based tactics that the Nazis had used would be effective in such rough terrain. And so uh, they, the Germans pulled the Allied troops out of position and then panzers swept through, trapping the Allies against the coast. And then you have the evacuation at Dunkirk. Uh, one would think that based on you know World War I and sort of the previous history, the Allies would have anticipated this and they did have a blocking force but the, the speed and effectiveness of German tactics in the Second World War was just too much for the Allies to get, uh, was too much for the Allies to deal with. With France fallen and uh, the, the troops evacuated from Dunkirk, uh, the Nazis began, uh, the Germans began bombing the British. Uh, the Battle of Britain was the battle for dominance over the skies above uh, the English Channel between the Luftwaffe and the Royal Air Force. And although the Royal Air Force did hold their own, the Nazis staged months of bombing raids across cities in England, uh, hitting pretty much every target of interest, especially at night, uh, creating significant hardship for the British, which were now the last sort of bastion of the Allied powers still fighting in Europe. With all of this uncertainty, with Asia already in open war and Europe in open war, the election of 1940 was a, land, was a groundbreaking election in American history. 
I mean, it was a landslide win for Franklin Roosevelt, which on the one hand shouldn't be surprising because he's a massively popular president, but on the other hand should be incredibly surprising because it's his third term and no president has effectively won a third term at this point. And so looking at the map, obviously a couple of things should jump out at you. Uh, the popular vote and the electoral vote are well in favor of Roosevelt, comfortably in favor of Roosevelt, but not by as large a margin as he won in either of the other two elections. And so Franklin Roosevelt gets his third term and people are somewhat uncomfortable about this, but it's an unprecedented time. Uh, the Great Depression is still raging and both Europe and Asia are now facing world wars. Throughout all this, the United States attempted to stay neutral, but a series of events pushed us closer to war. In Asia, the Japanese annexed French Indochina, which uh, is modern-day Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, this territory was ostensibly French, but after the Germans conquered the French, the Vichy puppet state uh, gave a, a permission to the Japanese, who were at this point a Nazi ally, permission to uh, annex the northern part of the territory, which the French controlling ostensibly the southern part. With this new threat to Western colonies in the region, uh, the United States decided to pass an oil embargo on Japan, theoretically uh, depriving them of the ability to continue to declare war. For the United States, we believed that if we cut the Japanese off from oil, we would prevent them from being able to expand their empire and force them to, at best, consolidate their territory and, or at, sorry, at worst, consolidate their territory and, at best, uh, move, uh, like, withdraw from areas that they had taken and uh, stop being as aggressive. Uh, unfortunately, the Japanese began to look for other supplies of Western oil, namely the large reserves that were held by in American colonies like the Philippines and British colonies like Singapore. In Europe, the Neutrality Act prevented us from sending aid to England, who was continuing to struggle against Nazi Germany. Uh, the Roosevelt administration believed that England was sort of the uh, the last foothold or toehold on the European con near the European continent, and that if England fell, that it would be uh, very very difficult to drive the Nazis out of Europe. So, in response to this, the Roosevelt administration pushed the first ever peacetime draft in the United States and started bringing people into the army just in case, and transitioned from cash and carry to what's called Lend-Lease. Uh, Lend-Lease got rid of the cash requirement for giving resources to belligerent powers, and uh, it also got rid of the transportation requirement, and so we gave million, hundreds of millions of dollars in munitions to the UK, uh, the USSR, and China in order to try to slow the Axis powers' advances. Uh, at this point, we were, of course, not willing to actually get involved, but now we're simply loaning tanks, planes, bullets, food, industrial products, all of these things to the Allied powers with the idea, with the, um, the basic goal that, again, like in World War I, they're going to pay us back afterwards. Of course, now that American ships are moving armaments to belligerent powers in waters that are infested with submarines, Attacks happen. A number of American ships were attacked on their way specifically to provide aid for England because, of course, we're moving through the German submarine blockade zone. And so just like in the aftermath, in the lead up to World War I, this creates a public outcry. And Roosevelt is able to push a shoot on sight order for German submarines. And so American destroyers moving through, moving in con, moving to protect uh, convoys of U.S. ships are now fighting an undeclared naval war against German submarines. Although this war is undeclared and public opinion is turning sharply against Nazi Germany, there's not enough of a groundswell to yet bring the United States into the war. It would require a direct attack on the United States or some sort of a dramatic event before public opinion would shift and Roosevelt could ask Congress for a declaration of war. So right now, the situation is war in Asia, war in Europe, the United States providing aid to the Allies, trying to fight a proxy war against the Axis powers, but not yet officially involved. 